Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Justice of the United States, who will administer the presidential oath of office to William Jefferson Clinton. Chief Justice. Justice. Governor, are you ready to take the oath? I am. Will you please raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. to do it now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America, William Jefferson Clinton. My fellow citizens, today we celebrate the mystery of American renewal. This ceremony is held in the depth of winter, but by the words we speak and the faces we show the world, we force the spring. A spring reborn in the world's oldest democracy that brings forth the vision and courage to reinvent America. When our founders boldly declared America's independence to the world and our purposes to the Almighty, they knew that America, to endure, would have to change. Not change for change's sake, but change to preserve America's ideals, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Though we marched to the music of our time, our mission is timeless. Each generation of Americans must define what it means to be an American. On behalf of our nation, I salute my predecessor, President Bush, for his half century of service to America. And I thank the millions of men and women whose steadfastness and sacrifice 
triumphed over depression, fascism, and communism. Today, a generation raised in the shadows of the Cold War assumes new responsibilities in a world warmed by the sunshine of freedom, but threatened still by ancient hatreds and new plagues. Raised in unrivaled prosperity, we inherit an economy that is still the world's strongest, but is weakened by business failures, stagnant wages, increasing inequality, and deep divisions among our own people. When George Washington first took the oath I have just sworn to uphold, news traveled slowly across the land by horseback and across the ocean by boat. Now the sights and sounds of this ceremony are broadcast instantaneously to billions around the world. Communications and commerce are global. Investment is mobile. Technology is almost magical and ambition for a better life is now universal. We earn our livelihood in America today in peaceful competition with people all across the earth. Profound and powerful forces are shaking and remaking our world. And the urgent question of our time is whether we can make change our friend and not our enemy. This new world has already enriched the lives of millions of Americans who are able to compete and win in it. But when most people are working harder for less, when others cannot work at all, when the cost of health care devastates families and threatens to bankrupt our enterprises, great and small, when the fear of crime robs law-abiding citizens of their freedom, and when millions of poor children cannot even imagine the lives we are calling them to lead, we have not made change our friend. We know we have to face hard truths and take strong steps, but we have not done so. Instead, we have drifted, and that drifting has eroded our resources, fractured our economy, and shaken our confidence. Though our challenges are fearsome, so are our strengths. Americans have ever been a restless, questing, hopeful people. And we must bring to our task today the vision and will of those who came before us. From our revolution, to the Civil War, to the Great Depression, to the Civil Rights Movement, our people have always mustered the determination to construct from these crises the pillars of our history. Thomas Jefferson believed that to preserve the very foundations of our nation, we would need dramatic change from time to time. Well, my fellow Americans, this is our time. Let us embrace it. Our democracy must be not only the envy of the world, but the engine of our own renewal. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. And so today we pledge an end to the era of deadlock and drift, and a new season of American renewal has begun. To renew America, we must be bold. We must do what no generation has had to do before. We must invest more in our own people, in their jobs, and in their future, and at the same time, cut our massive debt. And we must do so in a world in which we must compete for every opportunity. It will not be easy. It will require sacrifice. But it can be done, and done fairly. Not choosing sacrifice for its own sake, but for our own sake. We must provide for our nation the way a family provides for its children. Our founders saw themselves in the light of posterity. We can do no less. Anyone who has ever watched a child's eyes wander into sleep knows what posterity is. 
Posterity is the world to come, the world for whom we hold our ideals, from whom we have borrowed our planet, and to whom we bear sacred responsibility. We must do what America does best, offer more opportunity to all, and demand more responsibility from all. It is time to break the bad habit of expecting something for nothing from our government or from each other. Let us all take more responsibility, not only for ourselves and our families, but for our communities and our country. To renew America, we must revitalize our democracy. This beautiful capital like every capital since the dawn of civilization, is often a place of intrigue and calculation. Powerful people maneuver for position and worry endlessly about who is in and who is out, who is up and who is down, forgetting those people whose toil and sweat sends us here and pays our way. Americans deserve better. And in this city today, there are people who want to do better. And so I say to all of you here, let us resolve to reform our politics so that power and privilege no longer shout down the voice of the people. Let us put aside personal advantage so that we can feel the pain and see the promise of America. Let us resolve to make our government a place for what Franklin Roosevelt called bold, persistent experimentation, a government for our tomorrows, not our yesterdays. Let us give this capital back to the people to whom it belongs. <laughs> to renew America, we must meet challenges abroad as well as at home. There is no longer a clear division between what is foreign and what is domestic. The world economy, the world environment, the world AIDS crisis, the world arms race, they affect us all. Today, as an old order passes, the new world is more free but less stable. Communism's collapse has called forth old animosities and new dangers. Clearly, America must continue to lead the world we did so much to make. While America rebuilds at home, we will not shrink from the challenges nor fail to seize the opportunities of this new world. Together with our friends and allies, we will work to shape change lest it engulf us. When our vital interests are challenged or the will and conscience of the international community is defied, we will act with peaceful diplomacy whenever possible, with force when necessary. The brave Americans serving our nation today in the Persian Gulf, in Somalia, and wherever else they stand are testament to our resolve. But our greatest strength is the power of our ideas, which are still new in many lands. Across the world, we see them embraced and we rejoice. Our hopes, our hearts, our hands are with those on every continent who are building democracy and freedom. Their cause is America's cause. The American people have summoned the change we celebrate today. You have raised your voices in an unmistakable chorus. You have cast your votes in historic numbers. And you have changed the face of Congress, the presidency, and the political process itself. Yes, you, my fellow Americans, have forced the spring. Now we must do the work the season demands. To that work I now turn with all the authority of my office. I ask the Congress to join with me. But no president, no Congress, no government can undertake this mission alone. My fellow Americans, you too must play your part in our renewal. I challenge a new generation of young Americans to a season of service to act on your idealism by helping troubled children, 
keeping company with those in need, reconnecting our torn communities. There is so much to be done. Enough indeed for millions of others who are still young in spirit to give of themselves in service too. In serving, we recognize a simple but powerful truth. We need each other, and we must care for one another. Today, we do more than celebrate America. We rededicate ourselves to the very idea of America, an idea born in revolution and renewed through two centuries of challenge, an idea tempered by the knowledge that but for fate, we, the fortunate and the unfortunate, might have been each other. An idea ennobled by the faith that our nation can summon from its myriad diversity the deepest measure of unity. An idea infused with the conviction that America's long, heroic journey must go forever upward. And so, my fellow Americans, as we stand at the edge of the 21st century, let us begin anew with energy and hope, with faith and discipline, and let us work until our work is done. The scripture says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. From this joyful mountaintop of celebration, we hear a call to service in the valley. We have heard the trumpets. We have changed the guard. And now, each in our own way, and with God's help, we must answer the call. Thank you, and God bless you all. Shortly after the November election, President Clinton asked noted educator, historian, and author, Dr. Maya Angelou, to compose a poem for this historic day. From Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and Wake Forest University, please welcome Dr. Angelou. Mr. President and Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Vice President and Mrs. Gore, and Americans everywhere, a rock, a river, a tree, hosts to species long since departed, marked the mastodon, the dinosaur, who left dry tokens of their sojourn here on our planet floor. Any broad alarm of their hastening doom is lost in the gloom of dust and ages. But today, the rock cries out to us, clearly, forcefully, come, you may stand upon my back and face your distant destiny but seek no haven in my shadow. I will give you no hiding place down here. You, created only a little lower than the angels, have crouched too long in the bruising darkness. 
have lain too long face down in ignorance, your mouths spilling words armed for slaughter. The rock cries out to us today, you may stand upon me, but do not hide your face. Across the wall of the world, a river sings a beautiful song. It says, come, rest here by my side. Each of you, a bordered country, delicate and strangely made, proud, yet thrusting perpetually under siege. Your armed struggles for profit have left collars of waste upon my shore, currents of debris upon my breast. Yet today, I call you to my riverside, if you will study war no more. Come, clad in peace, and I will sing the songs the Creator gave to me when I and the tree and the rock were one, before cynicism was a bloody seer across your brow, and when you yet knew, you still knew nothing. The river sang and sings on. There is a true yearning to respond to the singing river and the wise rock. So say the Asian, the Hispanic, the Jew, the African, the Native American, the Sioux, the Catholic, the Muslim, the French, the Greek, the Irish, the rabbi, the priest, the sheikh, the gay, the straight, the preacher, the privileged, the homeless, the teacher. They all hear the speaking of the tree. They hear the first and last of every tree speak to humankind today. Come to me here beside the river. Plant yourself beside the river. Each of you, descendant of some past on traveler, has been paid for. You who gave me my first name. You, Pawnee, Apache, Seneca. You, Cherokee Nation, who rested with me, then forced on bloody feet, left me to the employment of other seekers, desperate for gain, starving for gold. You, the Turk, the Arab, the Swede, the German, the Eskimo, the Scot. You, the Ashanti, the Yoruba, the crew, bought, sold, stolen, arriving on a nightmare, praying for a dream. Here, root yourselves beside me. I am that tree planted by the river which will not be moved. I the rock, I the river, I the tree, I am yours. Your passages have been paid. Lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the shape of your most private need. Sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your heart. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Do not be wedded forever to fear, yoked eternally to brutishness. The horizon leans forward offering you space to place new steps of change. Here, on the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out and upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country, no less to Midas than the mendicant, no less to you now than the mastodon then. Here, on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes, and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of the 1993 presidential inauguration. As soon as the ceremony is over, my colleague on the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, the distinguished uh, Senator from Alaska, Ted Stevens, will form the presidential escort to the east front of the Capitol. To conclude our program now, please rise for the benediction by Reverend Billy Graham and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Marilyn Horn. Reverend Graham. Our Father, we pray that as we come to the end of this ceremony, that we will long remember the challenges that we have heard. And we dedicate ourselves to do everything in our power to keep those challenges and to dedicate ourselves anew, not only to you, but to America and all the great ideals that we stand for. We pray again that thou wouldst bless the President and the Vice President as they lead us in the years to come. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>